Thank you for coming this evening. Glad that you're able to be with us as we uh, continue our study in the book of First Timothy. We are discussing chapter five. If you'd like to turn to First Timothy chapter five, be beginning in verse 17 in just a few moments. We are uh, looking at the section as Timothy has discussed various different groups of people, various kinds of people that would typically be in a congregation. And he has just completed, in the section we have just studied, completed a discussion about widows and how they're to be cared for. Now we'll look a little bit more at uh, the elders and then some other instructions that he gives uh, for Timothy in teaching the word. So let's look at these instructions together, please. Let's go ahead and read 1 Timothy chapter 5 and uh, verse 17 through, uh, let's go 17 through 22. If you'd like to read 1 Timothy 5. Verse 17 through 22, please. First Timothy 5, verse 17 through 22. Bill, please. Let the elders who rule, rule well, be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word of doctrine. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the labor is worthy of his wages. Do not receive it in the accusations against the elder, except from two or three witnesses. Those are sending rebuke in the presence of all, that the rest also may fear. I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice, knowing nothing with partiality. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. Okay. So, verse 17 and 18, uh, he can, returns to the subject of the elders, but he's continuing to discuss the subject of honoring. Uh, so, first of all, he says uh, that the elders are worthy of double honor. So what does he mean when he talks about the idea that they are worthy of double honor? In what sense is he using the word honor here with question number 29? How is he using the word honor here? Double honor. Well, when elders are first mentioned, it's to be said they are, it's, it's a worthy or an honorable position to take, right? All right. So first of all, we have the word honor in a different sense than what we've been studying in the, about honoring widows. The honoring of widows was financial support, caring for their needs. But the word honor also has a different meaning in many scriptures, and that, that is it relates to a respect or a appreciation, valuing. And so elders should be valued for the work that they do. Uh, he says, but they rule well, they should be honored so the double honor would be what then? So on the one hand, there's honor in the sense of valuing or appreciating. And the other honor would be, what else in the in verse? Support. Okay, then you can financially support them. So it'd be double honor, honoring in the two different ways. Uh, so he says that this is for those who rule well, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. So we spent a lot of time in chapter three talking about the role of elders. Uh, what does this verse teach us about the role of elders? What do we learn about elders in, in this verse? They're to be honored if they do what? Karen? Rule well. Rule well. So here we have a passage among those that we talked about, we discussed about elders, showing that elders do have a leadership role which involves authority, not in the sense of making laws different from what God says, but in the realm of the rules that God has given, they are responsible to make decisions that the congregation should follow. So in that sense, they rule. And here you have a passage that says so. Okay. Uh, but they're not only rule, but what else do they do? Frank. The labor in the preaching and the teaching. Okay. So they labor in preaching and teaching, and apparently some do more than others, and then they, they would be supported financially especially if they put an emphasis on doing that work, uh, maybe more, we would say, full-time or more so than uh, someone who is, uh, has an, another job that they don't have as much time for the work of preaching and teaching. But all of them, all elders are responsible to teach in the Word 
and to lead in the congregation. So, and those who do that job properly are ought to be respected and appreciated for what they do. Okay, comments on uh, verse 17. Now, verse 18, he uses an example, uh, two actually passages, to explain or demonstrate why this is true. Um, and he says this is scripture. What, what, are the, what does the first one say? The first one says, he shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. What's he talking about? What's the point of the illustration? Where is it found in the Old Testament? What's the point of it? Not muzzling the ox. Karen. It's Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. It says the same thing. Um, and uh, I don't know much about cattle, but I guess in those days, uh, the ox went around in a circle as they were turning the corn, and they were being, so they're supposed to be allowed to eat while they do that. Okay. All right, so the passage is Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. It's also quoted in 1 Corinthians 9, also they're discussing the support of gospel preachers. Uh, and so the idea was, as Karen was saying, that they would sometimes have a, an animal, an ox in this case, walking on the grain. They'd spread the grain out on a level area and have the animal walk on it to separate the wheat from the chaff. And uh, if they muzzled the ox, then here he is doing this work, and here's this grain right there in front of him, but he's not allowed to eat it. Uh, and then so the scripture said, don't do that. He's doing the work. He deserves to be allowed to uh, benefit from the work that he's doing and to eat the grain. Okay, so the application to preachers would be what then, or to elders? What's the application then? If that's the, the illustration, what's the point of it? Okay, so the application is to uh, elders and preachers, 1 Corinthians 9, that they're working, They uh, it's Scriptural is proper for them to be financially supported for the work that they're doing. It doesn't mean that every preacher has to be supported or every elder has to be supported, but it's proper to do so. It's a scriptural, a scriptural principle. Uh, certainly, if it applies to an animal, it would apply to the elders. And then this last part of the verse, he quotes another scripture, which says the labor is worthy of his wages. Where is that one found? And what's the, the meaning of that one? The labor is worthy of his hire or his wages. What's the point there? Terry. It's in Luke 10, verse 7, when Jesus was sending out the um, 72. He says, um, uh, and remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Okay. So when Jesus sent out uh, the apostles in the 70 on their work of preaching, they were to go into a city and find someone who would be willing to support them by letting them stay in their home and provide a, a, a room and board for them, we would say. Uh, and the, the, the principle is that they're working hard, they're preaching the gospel, that those who accept and believe what's being taught should support them for that. All right, so that back here in 1 Timothy 5 is being applied now to the elders as well. The laborer is worthy of his wages, of his hire. Okay? So what are some applications we can make? What are some lessons that you might suggest that we can learn here from these passages? Any comments on this? Where would the money come from that would come out of the treasury? Okay. All right. So by implication, is there... There's a fund, uh, good point, but there's a fund of money that's used for this work, isn't there? Uh, and that fund of money then would, obviously, is the collection being taken up on the first day of the week for the, the church, just like in Philippians chapter 4 when we studied there. The, Paul was supported by the church in Philippi. 1 Corinthians 9, he, as we talked about, he was defending the right of preachers to be supported, the same thing. So there's an implication here that the church has the right to support gospel preachers and elders and so on. Okay, any other lessons? Rick. Yeah, the elders, going back to them, not the double honor and everything. 
Don't muzzle out the ox. Don't deter them from doing what they're doing. They're doing a double honor job. They're doing a great job. And support them in any way you can. Okay. Um, and sometimes if, if we insist that they not be supported, even though we could support them, but we're not willing to, it actually ends up hindering their work. They're not able to do the work as well uh, if we attend, use that approach. All right. A couple other points that I'd like to, to mention. Um, he points out that you rule, uh, support, or honor elders if they rule and especially if they labor in the word and the doctrine. Uh, so it seems to me that here's a passage that shows clearly that even though a man may be, a, uh, we would say, as supported as a gospel preacher, he could also serve as an elder. Uh, that's, we pointed out in studying the elders that those are two different works. That just because a man is a, a preacher doesn't make him a pastor, that is an elder. Uh, those are two different works. Uh, if a man is not qualified, according to the requirements for being an elder, he may still preach the gospel, but he wouldn't be qualified as an elder. But some men are gospel preachers who are qualified as elders and therefore would have, uh, could be supported as a, an elder, gospel preacher, as well as in their work of preaching and teaching. Uh, so this, this passage seems to me to show that to be clear the case, uh, that may be uh, not necessarily always the best arrangement, but it certainly would be scriptural. Peter, for example, in 1 Peter 5 was an apostle, a gospel preacher, and an elder. Okay, so a man may have more than one uh, uh, often position, you might say. Then there's the idea of the scripture. He refers to these passages that he quotes as scripture. The scripture says this. The first one is from the Old Testament. The second one is from the New Testament. What does that tell you about the New Testament? Then? And this is question number 31. What do we learn about scripture from this, from the way Paul uses the reference here? Right. The that even the writings of the New New Testament are that are inspired by the Holy Spirit are considered scripture. Okay. Very important point. We talked about that when we studied in Second Peter chapter three, uh, where Peter referred to the writings of Paul as a scripture, like other scripture. And so it's important to understand, and I think sometimes we just take for granted as we read through our Bibles. We read about scripture, or we read a passage that says it is written. And so we talk about, or we think about, uh, okay, well, that, that's scripture. We know it. to us that means it's part of the Bible. It's part of the word of God. Uh, but we have to understand, as the New Testament was being written, they didn't have the whole thing like we have it. And so decisions were being made as to what constituted scripture, what belonged to part of the, the Bible, and what didn't. Um, and so when... If Jesus or the apostles would say things like, it is written, and quote a scripture, we see the attitude they had towards scripture as inspired, authoritative, divine revelation to guide their lives. So when passages like this then refer to New Testament as scripture, it means the same thing. And we need to have this, the same respect for New Testament as being from God, inspired by God, as they did with their recon recognition of the Old Testament. Okay, so the Old Testament, New Testament, it's all Scripture. Anything else, verse 18, on this discussion of honoring elders? Anybody? Karen? I share. Um, I think one implication of the fact that elders can be uh, financially supported would be um, how much time it takes to do that job. Um, it's real easy to not really know if, you're el if elders are doing very much because maybe you can't see a lot of the work that they do, but they work hard. It takes a lot of time, and that's the reason that they deserve the other kind of honor <laughs> um, and respect for what they do, but it's a hard enough job that they can be, uh, that the church can provide for them. Okay, so we need to appreciate the work that elders do, um, not just as an honor to them, in the sense of, okay, we'll put them in this job so that we can, uh, Show them honor. The, the goal is an honor. The goal is the work. The goal is uh, accomplishing this ruling well, preaching and teaching and so on. Uh, but if they do that work well, it's a hard work. It's a lot of work. And it's not only difficult, a lot of time consuming. 
it's emotional too. It's it's difficult. It's stressful, uh, challenging for men to, to have that kind of leadership responsibility, and they need to be appreciated for it. And and uh, it's proper to even support them financially. Anything else to verse eighteen then? All right. Now, verse nineteen, we get into the subject of what happens if there's a problem, uh, an accusation of sin against uh, an elder. Someone thinks they've committed sin. And he establishes a principle in verse 19, question number 32. Uh, how is this to be handled? What do we learn about it in verse 19? If there's an accusation against an elder, what do we learn about it? It must be the evidence of two or three witnesses. All right, two or three witnesses. And you don't, you don't uh, consider the man to be guilty unless there's evidence, and the evidence requires witnesses, uh, two or three witnesses. So when I ask you question number 33, where else does the Bible talk about this idea of witnesses, plural witnesses, to establish guilt? When an accusation has been made against someone, how do we know uh, that it requires two or three witnesses? Other passages that talk about this. Terry. Matthew 18, 16, where you take uh, one or two to establish every word when there's a disagreement between two brothers. All right, so in Matthew 18, 16, we have that passage there, not just about elders, but in general, the fact that when you have uh, a one brother who believes another brother has sinned against him, he's to go and talk with him. That's a private situation there. He's to go and talk, and we'll talk more about it in just a couple of verses here. Uh, but you talk to them in private. If you can't resolve it, you take one or two more so that at two or three witnesses, every word can be established. That's the principle being used here as regard an elder. Okay? Other passages. Any other passages about the idea of the two or three witnesses? Anybody else? Other comments on that? Terry. 2 Corinthians 13, 1, um, Paul uses that same requirement that there be, um, I don't have it open, but that there be more than one witness. Okay. Uh, in that case, he's, he's been making... He has been making accusations against some in the church of Corinth. And he says if he comes, um, there'll be he's going to get the testimony of witnesses. In other words, he plans to proceed with uh, congregational discipline if they don't straighten up. And there's other passages, John chapter 8, verse 17. Jesus used the principle to uh, that he had more than one witness for who he was and so on. And he, he goes back to the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 19 and verse 15. Uh, and Old Testament passages like that were in order to uh, put to death uh, someone who is accused under the law, there needed to be two or more witnesses. So here's a biblical principle. Now here it's being applied to the elders here in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 19. Now, what do we learn from that? What do we, what's important for us to understand in this principle if we have a problem in a congregation with an elder? You have to rule out gossip. You okay. have to rule out gossip. Okay. Anybody can make an accusation. Anybody. And there's all kinds of examples in the Bible and in our society. You see it constantly. People, you see it in politics and in the news all the time. Somebody accusing somebody of some. Where's the evidence? Some man is being considered for some position, maybe a judge or whatever. And here comes these people. Well, he did this. He did that. Well, who are the witnesses? Uh, and so it's a it's a principle of justice, is what it is, that you don't consider somebody to be guilty unless there's proof. And one of the primary ways of getting proof is at testimony of witnesses. But just because one person makes an accusation doesn't mean that the one they're accusing is guilty. Because anybody can say that. I get get mad at somebody and say, Oh, he's a such and such. He did such and such. Well, what's, what do you prove? Well, I don't know. I, who else saw it? Well, I don't know. You don't have a conviction simply because one person accuses somebody of wrongdoing. Okay? Now, why is that especially important for elders? Why do you suppose he singles out elders in regard to that? We've already established it in these other places. Why especially for elders? If you make an accusation against an elder, your 
putting a blemish on the whole congregation, on the whole flock. Okay, so the position that he has makes it especially, uh, he's especially vulnerable. People don't like a decision that he made uh, or don't like the fact that he's uh, rebuked them for some sin. They get mad and they decide they're going to take it out on him by making some accusation. And first thing you know, you've got turmoil in a congregation. People saying, well, he needs to step down. So and so said such and such. Or they don't know, or they just don't even know what to do about it. What are we going to do? So, so he's been accused. What are we going to do? Here's a pattern. Just like the pattern in Matthew 18, for dealing where one person accuses another of sin, there's a pattern for dealing for it. Uh, and we look at the Apostle Paul, we look at Jesus, we look at the other apostles. Over and over again, they were accused of sin. Just because a man is accused doesn't mean that he should be considered guilty or even that in our minds we should treat him as, think of him as guilty unless there's proof. There must be evidence and more than one witness. Okay? What else can we learn? Any other comment? Well, the, to even be appointed an elder, they have to be above reproach, and so their character uh, should set them above the reproach of the accusers. Okay. All right, so we shouldn't just, uh, we should recognize that these men have already been established uh, when they were being considered for elders as uh, upright men, and so don't just take one man's word against him and in the accusation. Okay, other comments, other lessons we can tear it. I think it also, you have to go back to the beginning of verse 17. When you have elders who rule well, that's not always the case. And so you may have elders that have been appointed that are not ruling well. And then you really have an issue. They haven't met the qualifications to begin with, perhaps in some ways. And then when it brings trouble into the congregation, it makes it even harder. Okay, so that question came up, you may recall, when we were discussing the qualifications of elders, and the question was asked, what if you have a man and he's been appointed, he's in the office, but um, there's either sin or he's just not, uh, he's no longer qualified. What do you do? Uh, maybe it's not even his fault that he's not qualified. Maybe it's his, uh, his wife or one of his children that are uh, misbehaving. It affects his qualification. He may not have sinned, but it affects his qualification. What do you do? Well, you, I believe this is what's saying you need witnesses. You don't just somebody say, well, I saw his wife do so-and-so, so he's not qualified. They may just be trying to get rid of an elder that they don't like. You need to have uh, testimony, even if it's a case of whether or not he has lost his qualifications. Uh, now, obviously, if it's sin, not such as a matter of qualification, it's also a matter of uh, uh, discipline if he won't repent of it. If he's convicted and he won't repent. Uh, so there's, with an elder, there's a lot of things to consider, not just the question of that it might be for another member, it's the same, but it's the same principle. You have to have evidence to convict him either of sin or if, that he's lost his qualification as an elder. Okay, other comments on verse 19 now as applied to elders. Anybody else? All right, so moving on then, we have a, now what if we have a question, an issue of sin in verse 20, and someone has committed sin, uh, presumably it would still apply to the elders, so it would be more general, it appears as we go along, that he's discussing this more broadly than just the elders, but it's certainly going to apply to the elders as well. So question number 35, uh, verse uh, 20, well, it's actually verse 34 as well. What does he say should be, should be done about sin according to verse 20? What do we learn about dealing with sin in the congregation in verse 20? Then that sin rebuke before all, that others may also. All right, so we're supposed to be, uh, in some cases, there is a public rebuke. Sin rebuke in the presence of all. And what reason does he give? Why is this important to do at certain times? Why is it needed? Uh, 
Fear or have a respect for what's Okay. Uh, so again, we're back to the point of if one person in a congregation sins, certainly an elder, but anybody for that matter, and if it becomes known in the congregation, if nothing's done about it, or if the congregation doesn't know of anything being done about it, then people get the attitude, well, must not matter. Must not be serious. There's nothing being done about it. But if it's publicly dealt with, then everybody realizes this is serious. We must take this seriously uh, because there's sin here. Okay, but then I also ask you the question, this last part of question 35, uh, does this apply to all sins? Are we talking about every, every sin anybody ever commits? We're going to stand in front of the congregation and tell everybody what they did wrong. Is that what he's saying? And how do you know? Terry. The use of the word persist. The use of the word persist here. Uh, those who persist indicates... Okay, your translation says persist in sin? Yes. Okay. That, that indicates that this has been dealt with before. Or it's an ongoing thing. It's not a one-time happening. Okay. Uh, all right. Other comments? Uh, Sharon. Well, there's a connection to the previous verse that we're talking about a situation with two or three witnesses. So this is definitely something that multiple people know about. This isn't just a private sin that was taken care of between two people like in uh, Matthew 18, but this is uh, something where we've already brought multiple people into the situation. Okay, so in the first place, back to Terry's point, if a person committed their sin and then repents of it, then certainly uh, and nobody else knows about it. Maybe Matthew 18, uh, one, maybe this person, elder or whoever it is, sinned against somebody and they talk about it like the Bible says and they work it out. That's the end of it. Then there's, and this doesn't happen again. There's no reason for it to be brought before the congregation. It was a private matter. It was resolved privately. However, uh, if he continues to do it, as in Matthew 18, then you bring others in, and now you've got your two or three witnesses, and then if it's necessary, then it goes before the church and so on. Okay, so as, first of all, it's a sin that they, it, the person who won't repent of it, but secondly, uh, it isn't, at the beginning at least, a private sin. Uh, this is something that is rebuked in the presence of all. Well, Matthew 18 says you don't rebuke it in the presence of all uh, if it's a private sin unless the person won't repent. Then it comes before the congregation. Okay, other comments? Might there be a situation, and how do you know, in which a person may commit a sin which from the very outset should be dealt with publicly, that it doesn't have to be dealt with in a private way like Matthew 18? And how do you know? Well, can you think of a situation in the scriptures where someone did commit a sin that was known publicly and was immediately dealt with publicly? Terry. When uh, Peter had withdrawn himself from and would not eat with the uh, Gentiles and Paul when Paul came you, you came okay, and that's Galatians chapter 2, verse 11, and down through the verse 14, thereabouts. Uh, Peter, who obviously, not only an apostle, but had been the first one to preach the gospel to Gentiles with Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, yet later on, uh, he himself, because of the influence of certain uh, Gen uh, Jewish Christians who thought that Gentiles were more or less second-rate citizens, or at least had to be common Jews by being circumcised, uh, Peter refused to eat with them. He would eat with them until these Jews came, then he refused to eat with them. That made the Gentiles look like that they were not fully accepted as members. And the passage says Paul rebuked him to his face and in the presence of the other people. Right there with the people that the sin had been committed, he rebukes them for it. That has the effect then of showing not just Peter, but everybody else who knows about the situation is involved in the situation, that it's wrong. And it has to be corrected. Okay? So a private matter is dealt with privately to begin with. It becomes public only if it's not resolved privately. But a matter that's known publicly to begin with, public sin involves public sin, 
may very well be best to start with a public rebuke so that everybody, as like the passage says, everybody uh, will fear, everybody will recognize the sin that's involved. Okay, other comments on verse 20 and the principle we're discussing here. Other scriptures or other comments you'd like to make? Sharon. First, I think showed that elders shouldn't be accused lightly without evidence, but verse 20 shows that elders can sin, and if so, they do need to be rebuked. And we shouldn't treat elders the way some denominations treat their leaders, as if they can't ever sin or ever do anything wrong. Uh, we do take it seriously, but it can happen. Okay, and so elders are humans, and many, many times, elders are responsible for leading a congregation astray. Acts chapter 20, Paul very specifically warned the elders in Ephesus about that very danger, that they might be guilty of leading the congregation astray. And so this, we need a way of dealing with it, a way of handling that situation, not just saying, well, nothing we can do. He's an elder. Uh, he's appointed. Uh, it's, it's not an elder always, once an elder, always an elder. Uh, there's a uh, a pattern for dealing with it if an elder does commit sin. Other comments through verse 20. All right, now verse 21. He gives us another principle about dealing with these, uh, the problems of sin. And again, it would be for an elder, but it's anybody, really as far as I can see. And what, uh, what, uh, what lessons does he teach us about dealing with sin in verse 21? And now we're on question number 36. What, pr what principle does he teach us here? Well, evidently there's a little bit of a counsel here, right? Sir? That's, that's uh, your hell before. And that is uh, God, Jesus Christ, and the elect angels. So there's a hierarchy there that you got to be respectful of. Okay, so the, the, how you handle this is you need to realize that God's aware of this, and you you are going to be accountable. Not only the person accused is going to be accountable, but we're who, those of us who handle it have a responsibility before God to handle it properly. And what does God say about that? What does God say about in verse twenty one? In addition to these other principles, what do we learn in verse twenty one? Without Karen, uh, it's to be done without prejudice. Without prejudice and without what else? Partiality. Partiality. No prejudice, no partiality. What does that mean? What do those terms mean? Question 36, define partiality. What does he mean by partiality? Preference. Okay, preference. Uh, unfair discrimination, we say favoritism. Okay, that's partiality. And prejudice would be what? Dealing with, with prejudice would be what? Classification. Okay. Classifying them guilty or innocent before you've ever even considered the proof. Bias. Bias, okay, yes. And some of the translations have some of these terms in them. So, so the idea is, well, you tell me. What's the application? What do we learn from that? What well, might be some examples of question number 37? Uh, no, I guess I'm getting ahead of myself. What will be some examples of this? Some applications of prejudice or partiality in making judgments like this. Well, just like what he's talking about before the Peter and the Jew and the Jews and the Greeks not eating with them, and how he showed partiality there. That that's a class of that's what I was talking about. I like the classification of people, um, rich, poor. Oh, I see. Okay, all right. Yeah, so uh, certain people, classes of people, in, uh, people with certain uh, backgrounds, racial uh, differences or whatever, um, or wealth, or education, or influence, uh, you might tend to overlook if they've got something in common with you or something you like about them or they're wealthy. Well, you... Oh, well, we know, got to go careful with brother so-and-so, you know, he's a big giver. Where if somebody else did the same thing, 
uh, then the rebuke would, and the procedure uh, of Scripture would deal with it uh, much more firmly. Uh, or if it's maybe a personal friend, or you you just have in your mind that, yeah, I, that's so-and-so. He's always doing stuff. He's probably guilty. Before you've ever even heard the, the facts of the case. That's prejudice. Okay. All right, so we have to in we have to have the witnesses, uh, and we have to make sure that we do this with impartiality and without prejudice in making decisions in these cases. Okay. Other comments or discussion on verse twenty-one. Anybody? Okay. So the rebuke and discipline that we're talking about is scriptural. It must be done, uh, but we must not cater to certain groups, groups of people. Um, we must make sure we have the evidence, and if so, we proceed, no matter who it is. It's based on their conduct, not their uh, status otherwise. Okay? Anything else there, verse 21? All right, verse 20. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. Okay? So, several questions we can ask about that. Uh, what might be some ways, question number 37 now, what might be some ways that we might uh, be tempted to share in somebody else's sins? What might be a situation that uh, somebody else, now we're talking about somebody else's sin, now we may become guilty. Because they're guilty. What might be some situations that would lead to that? Okay. Uh, just approving or encouraging someone in what they're doing or saying, uh, if it's if it's not right. Okay. The obvious situation is somebody just says something, so you go along and do the same thing. You participate in it too, but we can be uh, share in somebody's sin. That word share, what's another term often used in the New Testament for sharing? Sharing is called what? Fellowship. fellowship. You can have fellowship in a sin. You can share in a sin without actually doing the wrong thing. As Frank said, it might Jesus by encouraging it or defending it, saying, oh, that's not wrong. I don't see anything wrong with that. Maybe it's back to the idea of the partiality and the prejudice. Well, it's a family member. If it was somebody else, you could see it, but you're going to defend it because of who it is. All right, so now you're sharing in their sin. You have become part, uh, guilty because of your participation in that way. Terry. In Romans 1, uh, 32, that's what's going on. Uh, the people that know God's righteousness decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. They not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. Okay. And uh, there are many other scriptures that talk about having fellowship in error, aren't there? Ephesians 5, 11, We're not to have fellowship in other people's sins, but rather reprove them. That's the point here in 1 Timothy chapter 5. Reprove sin. Don't share in it. Don't become partaker in it. Don't go along with it. Uh, but if it's wrong, say it's wrong. As back in verses 20 and so forth. So in, in that way, you keep yourself pure. You see, if you participate or you go along, now you've become a sinner yourself. You got to keep yourself pure. What about the lay hands hastily? Verse, uh, the first part of the verse, last part of question 37. What, what is he talking about? Don't lay hands hastily on anyone. And obviously, a lot of you are going to be thinking about there was a sermon from a week and a half or so ago about laying on of hands. Uh, how does this relate, or does it relate, to what Daryl said? Terry. These are instructions that Paul has given to a young, a lot of this is going, it's going to Timothy. He's a young preacher, a young man, getting started on this, but the idea of not giving your approval to somebody before you know who they are. Don't do it in a hurry. Okay. Don't quickly give approval. But in the context 
of verse 22, it's don't quickly do what? Not just give approval, but disapproval. I, th I think it's both. You see it, Terry? Uh, okay. So if you're back to the, you got to get the evidence. You got to have the witnesses. You got to have the, uh, uh, know the situation. Don't be prejudiced. Don't be partial. Don't be hasty, either in agreeing or disagreeing. But take your time. Okay, so I, personally, I don't really think that this has much to do with the laying on of hands in the sense of, uh, as with some cases in the scriptures, of, uh, uh, well, certainly not giving spiritual gifts. It certainly isn't that. Or even in the more general sense of just uh, uh, appointing someone to an office or anything like that. It's more a situation of agreeing or disagreeing with what somebody's doing. Okay, other comments through verse 22. Anybody? Before we close. Terry. This seems similar to me, the, like uh, the laying on hands of Paul when they grabbed him to say he was guilty. Look who we found. He's, he's guilty. That kind of laying on hands, is that what you think this is? Yes, and like Acts chapter 4, verse 3, when the apostles were arrested, it says they laid hands on him. Well, they weren't, there was no nothing good about that. They were grabbing him to to arrest him. They were taking hold. It's the same thing here. It seems to me. Yeah. Uh, don't don't quickly uh, approve or disagree with someone. Make sure you've got your facts. All right. Anything else in verse twenty-two? Anybody? All right. Next time, Lord willing, we'll take up in verse twenty-three. Talk about the uh, wine for the stomach's sake and infirmities, and hopefully finish the chapter. And then we get into chapter six. We talk about another couple of groups of people. Some of the groups we've been talking about, we're going to talk about servants, and we're going to talk about false teachers. Discuss those Lord willing in chapter 6. So, thank you.